weapons file by force. And these were the elements that the people of Johannesburg would rise up in revolution. They would call for assistance and Jamison would respond to that call with a group of mercenaries and Rhodesian police and as it were take the country. The promised uprising failed to materialize but Jamison continued with the plan. He rode into the Transvaal at the head of his men. But the Boers were ready for them. They let the invaders ride on until they were surrounded, and then picked them off with murderous accuracy. According to the Boer commander, many of Rhodes' raiders were boys in their late teens, and many were weeping. The Jamison raid into the Transvaal was widely regarded as an unprovoked attack on an independent state, a naked act of aggression. It sent shockwaves around the world. Rhodes was forced to resign as Prime Minister of Cape Colony, and he was summoned to London to answer to the British Parliament. But he had nothing to fear. Public opinion in Britain was increasingly anti-Boer. The Queen expressed the popular mood in a letter to her daughter. The Boers are a horrid people, cruel and overbearing. Rhodes had set Britain on a dangerous course. His violent and unscrupulous methods provoked a reaction that shook the empire to its core. And this at a time when the Queen was preparing to celebrate the glories and triumphs of her reign. Eighteen ninety seven was the year of Victoria's Diamond Jubilee, sixty years on the throne. Soldiers and colonial leaders from all over the empire came to London to take part in a spectacular parade. It was recorded by the new movie cameras. A little old woman under the umbrella now ruled over a fifth of the population of the planet. A never to be forgotten day. No one ever, I believe, has met with such an ovation as was given to me. The cheering was quite deafening, and every face seemed to be filled with real joy. But this joy would soon turn to disillusionment, as soldiers who had paraded the streets of London were sent to fight a war in South Africa. The British dispatched an army to accomplish what Rhodes had failed to do, put an end to Boer independence. The Boer War began just a year after the Queen's Jubilee. The British believed it would be short and glorious, but the Boers were well armed. One English private wrote in his diary, As soon as we started to advance, the bullets began to fly. All of a sudden, a maxim began to play upon us. That stopped the firing line. For flat on their faces, they fell, and devil of a move would they make at all. The British have gone to war in South Africa, very ill-prepared for this type of warfare. Most of the generals who, who fought the Boers were, were used to people armed with spears and lances. Well, it was a shock for them. There were instances of surrender. People couldn't take it any longer. They just threw down their weapons um, and, and ran back. There were cries of cowardice. Successive defeats shattered the confidence of the British public. Even the staunch Victoria was shaken. No news today, only lists of casualties. The war touched her personally when her own grandson, Prince Christian Victor, was numbered among the dead soldiers. The British stepped up their war effort. They shipped a quarter of a million troops to southern Africa. 
slowly the tide turned against the Boers. The Boer armies were defeated, but their young commandos continued a vicious guerrilla war. In retaliation, the British commander-in-chief, General Kitchener, pursued a war of attrition, burning farmsteads and rounding up women and children. He interned them in the world's first concentration camps. Large numbers of Boer civilians are exposed to typhus and cholera, and the result are death camps, which the British press uh, and various British uh, liberals take a great interest in and expose as a barbaric methods of warfare. The mood of the Queen and the public remained stoutly patriotic, but the disasters of the Boer War fed a growing disillusionment from which the imperial ideal would never recover. Cecil Rhodes, the man who had done more than any other to start this war, had one more battle to fight. His heart condition made it difficult for him to breathe. He was carried to his little cottage on the coast in the hope that the fresh sea breezes would relieve his anguish. But here, at the age of 48, he finally lost his race with death. He had left orders that he was to be buried in Rhodesia, at a spot he called the View of the World. His grave was marked not with a cross, but with a massive stone. It was, in the words of a British High Commissioner, a haunted, sinister, pagan place. Many of the attitudes that Rhodes had embodied were buried with him. The era of Victoria was over, and with it the unquestioning imperialism she had come to represent. Queen Victoria died in the evening of January 22, 1901. She was 81 years old. On her own instructions, she was dressed in white. Spring flowers were sprinkled over her body. Her face was covered by the veil she had worn at her wedding with Prince Albert 60 years before. Queen Victoria's death was seen by many as the passing of an era. But also in 1901, there were fears that other powers were rising up, which might start to put pressure on Britain uh, to yield its primacy in the world. So that uh, the last days of the Queen's reign, there were fears and misgivings. Rhodes had overstretched the empire. The Boer republics he had driven Britain to conquer were soon given independence. His aggressive spirit was to be replaced by a Gladstonian liberalism. Those ideals that Prince Albert had instilled in Victoria in the early years of her reign proved in the end to be more enduring than the harsh imperialism of her final decade.